This is In Hindsight, Half a Century of Research Discoveries in Canadian History, presented by Dr. Donald B. Smith and produced by the Ontario Historical Society. Great pleasure to be back again, this time with a very, very interesting topic to me, one of my favorites in the whole discussion of the Mississaugas of the Credit. It's the story of Nani Banikwe, the upright woman, Peter Jones's niece and actually adopted daughter. That's what he later called her. Uh, she's a wonderful, wonderful story. And this is then the last of four episodes on the Mississaugas of the Credit, a passion of my research career. Well, Nani is very remarkable. She was born in 1824. She lived till 1865. And she's remarkable for many reasons. And that, of course, is the purpose of this episode. But what makes her unique is that we can document her. We have good documentary sources, which is so, so difficult. Women, not necessarily just Indigenous women, but non-Indigenous as well, it's so hard to get sources before the 20th century. And uh, with Nani, it's it's delightful because she's an Indigenous woman, which makes it even tougher because their cultures were oral, not written. Um, but nevertheless, we have a substantial amount of information about her. And in herself, she's an interesting character. I'd like to uh, just begin with uh, overview. She is an incredible woman. I've mentioned that before. And I'll tell you why I think, why I have such a high esteem for her. It's because that she kept on, despite increasing state and non-Indigenous missionary pressure, she held to her language and held to her people and championed their need for justice. The high point of this woman's activist career was her voyage, while several months pregnant, across the North Atlantic to take a land petition to Queen Victoria at Buckingham Palace. <laughs> and it's extraordinary. She actually met Queen Victoria. Not only was land a concern, Nanny also championed the rights of women like herself who lost their Indian status because they married non-Indians. So we've got two major aspects in our activism, land rights and female indigenous rights. Well, let's begin at the beginning. Nani, no, uh, I should say her full name is Nani Banikwe, up or upright woman in English. She was known to her friends, a short form of Nani Banikwe. She was known as Nani. And that's what I'm going to be referring to her as in the episode. Very familiar, and nothing wrong with that. She's a very, I feel, I feel quite close to her after all these years, half a century, really. She was born on the banks of the Credit River, just uh, 20 kilometers west of Toronto, now in the city of Mississauga. She was born there just, uh, well, almost a decade after the War of 1812, a catastrophic event in the lives of the Anishinaabeg or Ojibwe people. Nani, just a, a year before her birth, her parents had become involved in part of a revolutionary movement amongst the Anishinaabeg called the Mississauga. They adopted Christianity. Large numbers of them did. Mississauga, once again, just to review, is the term that the settlers used for the Anishinaabe or Ojibwe on the North Shore of Lake Ontario. And a large number of them, through the influence, through the leadership of Peter Jones, already reviewed in a previous episode, signed up and went to the mission station that was established at the Credit River. At the age of two, Nani lived at the mission, a community of about 200 people. Now, does this mean in any way that she's, her family had signed off being First Nations? They signed off being Indigenous? Well, not at all. The credit people in the 1820s and 30s still spoke their language and remained self-governing. They were enthusiastic Christians, 
Here's an extraordinary detail. In its formative years, the credit Christian community sent out, their own population was only about 200, they sent out 24 of their members throughout the larger Anishinaabeg world around the Great Lakes. They sent out 24 of their number as missionaries, interpreters, and school teachers. That's an incredible, incredible figure. Well, that's, I'll introduce you now to her parents. On is her father, his name was Bunch Sanigo, or Tiwagwab. He was a member of the Eagle Dodem, or clan. Now, Dodems are very important in the Anishinaabeg world. And Dodems, or clans, that's the identification, came through your father. So Nani's dad was Eagle Dodem, and therefore she was as well. Her mother was Otter, her English name, Mary Crane. And her mother, Mary, was a different clan. But Nani would descend from the father's side. It was paternal in that she was eagle. Peter Jones was also eagle totem. And she called him he, her uncle. Now, this is tricky because we've got to understand that when we're dealing in indigenous world, there are so many differences. And one is kinship. What, who, who is an, an, an uncle in the English tradition or European tradition is not necessarily the same in, in the Anishinaabeg. By the European system of kinship, he was probably a first cousin of one of her parents, but she called him uncle. So that's, it's just a, a different, a different descent rule. But for the purposes of the episode, we're going to follow what she called him in English, her uncle. Peter Jones was her uncle. Nanny's parents had reached adulthood in probably the worst decade in the history of the Credit River Mississauga. In the early 1820s, the poverty-stricken community verged on extinction. They'd lost huge tracts of land through treaties, which they regarded as sharing agreements, to the British. But the British regarded them as outright surrenders of the land. Two different, totally different understandings. So the Mississauga were left with a portion of their former land. The Mississauga had hoped that in return for sharing their territory with the British, the British would help them. They also believed that they'd retained the right to hunt, fish, and gather on their former territory. It was not occupied by European, well, not taken up by European farms. This was another misconception. The newcomers had proved ungrateful. After clearing and fencing their farms and preventing access for hunting, they wanted more land. And so there's more pressure. When Nanny's parents are growing up all around, the whole atmosphere is pressure to surrender more and more land. And so at the end, in 1820, shortly before Nani was born, they just had on the north shore of Lake Ontario three small tracts of land, one at the Credit, the other at Oakville, and at Bronte, communities farther to the west of the Credit, or I should say rivers farther to the west of the Credit. Incidentally, I'm from Oakville, so actually I was raised on what was, in 1820, an Indian reserve, but under tremendous pressure, the Mississauga, the, the, they understanding they retain hunting and fishing rights and whatnot. That in the same situation, they surrendered, or as the British would call it, they made a treaty and Oakville was taken over by the settlers. So bad, just, just terrible conditions. Well, this is where Peter Jones steps in. We covered that in a previous episode, episode five. He had become knowledgeable of farming and he knew English he knew the settler society, and he'd become a convert to Christianity, to Methodism. Today, the United Church of Canada is a descendant. He'd become a Christian, and he, and he was the instigator with some very important non-Indigenous allies, in particular, Edgerton Ryerson, founder, later the founder of the modern Ontario public school system, with non-Indigenous allies and fellow Indigenous allies, Indigenous Christians. A mission was established at the mouth of the Credit River. And here, a cultural revolution occurred. The Mississauga became farmers. 
they adopted to a settled way of life. And the various responsibilities of each group, men and women, changed. Formerly, the men's domain was the forest and the women's the lodge. The warriors hunted and fished. The women built the wigwams, butchered meat, tanned the hides, cooked, took care of the children, gathered firewood, prepared the fires, and planted Indian corn. But now the roles were reversed in the sense that men were involved with agriculture and women's activities were much more restricted. As a young girl at the credit mission, Nani assisted her mother with cooking, the laundry, and supervising her younger brothers and sisters. Hard work was highly regarded and also with self-reliance. Many, I, in saying that there's a cultural revolution, I don't want to overdo it because so much remained the same. The old culture couldn't just disappear overnight and there was no intent by the Indian Christians to let it happen. They retained, for example, their very important emphasis on self-reliance. Nani would be raised very, very, to be a very independent person. This was the traditional way. She also, as a young girl, learned certainly uh, domestic skills and all and uh, the new way of life, but her mother still taught her how to make moccasins and how to weave quilts into the round lid of a birch bark box. As did her mother before, Nani learned the herbal remedies of the Ojibwe women healers. The Christian Mississauga continued to value the old herbal medicines. The Christian converts also instructed their children to speak Ojibwe with absolute correctness. So, please, much of the old culture remained. And Nani learned as well, as in olden days, a great deal from her grandparents. In fact, there's a wonderful quote about her grandfather, who had been in the War of 1812. And I'll just read it. It's so good. This is something, we see, we're lucky. We have some of her writings and we have her English husbands. I'll introduce him shortly, William Sutton. This is what Nani wrote, wrote about her grandfather. My grandfather on my mother's side was a war chief and fought in the American War. That's the War of 1812. He died when I was a little girl, but I remember him well. He learned to love Jesus before he died. And I have often sat on the old man's lap but I am now just thinking how often he'd been present at those times when governors and generals had made their great speeches to the Indian warriors. They made speeches, her grandfather told her, so full of promises that all their children were never to be, the promises were never to be broken, ever. Never to be broken while grass grew and waters ran. That's what she remembered her grandfather telling her. So there's a great deal of traditional culture remains and a great under, a, a, an indigenous understanding of history. What's the most important institution at the credit mission for young people? Uh, that is for cultural change. It was the school. And the Methodists, they, very important. Education was top tops with them. Uh, well, there's a reason too. I mean, they want the students to learn to read the Bible. That's big time. But uh, also it's, it's it's very important to learn the new skills needed. English particularly to defend their land rights. Uh, also um, arithmetic, um, uh, agric basic agricultural practices and all. The schools are important. Now, again, we are blessed because of this abundance of records. William Lyon Mackenzie, famous editor of a newspaper, The Colonial Advocate, and later became a leading instigator of the rebellion of 1837 in Upper Canada. Well, he visited and made a detailed description of the school in 1830. Now, Nani would be a young, young girl, about five or six, and uh, it's just delightful, this quote that he gives us. Mackenzie reported that the large school building contained, quote, tiers of raised benches like a gallery. Those were in the rear. On one side sat the boys and the other the girls. Mackenzie found around the schoolroom lay Bibles, New Testaments, English and American books, a handsome map of the world, ar ar arithmetic figures, and a pasteboard used to introduce European concepts of time. 
Now, here is the best. This is really incredible. At the end of his description, Mackenzie added, quote, The walls of the school are ador- adorned with good moral maxims, and I perceived that one of the rules was rather novel, though doubtless in place here. The rule was, quote, No blanket to be worn in school. End of quote. Wonderful. Well, the credit people really made progress. In one decade, the Mississauga, by their own labor, had built a hospital, a mechanic shop, and eight barns, and it added over 20 houses to the original 20. Several families had their own orchards. The villagers had enclosed, had enclosed for pasture and cleared for farming 900 acres, that's 400 hectares, or nearly one third of the reserve. They raised wheat, oats, peas, corn, potatoes, and other vegetables. The band ran two sawmills. They had made incredible progress. The Mississauga uh, at the Credit Mission were nearly self-sufficient in their own milk and butter, potatoes, beef, and pork. At the mouth of the river, they laid out the village of Port Credit and sold the town lots. This is incredible. Now, also, credit should be given to another person besides those mentioned to date, and that is Eliza. Peter Jones's well-educated English wife, who came to the mission after her marriage in the fall of 1833. Eliza Field Jones took an interest in the bright, talented nanny. Now we have her dairies. This is incredibly intimate, this detail. At first, Eliza found nanny's behavior annoying. Eliza's first comment in her diary to her nine-year-old niece December the 22nd, 1833, reads, quote, attended the Sunday school, but felt discouraged by the imprudent and idle conduct, conduct of <laughs> Nani. <laughs> well, end of quote. But the relationship did improve. The next reference to Nani a year later mentions the evening Nani spent caring for her sick aunt. Eliza got very ill and Nani came over and helped her. A grateful Eliza noted, Quote, she was a quiet, attentive nurse. At the Joneses' home at the credit mission, Eliza taught Nani and other Mississauga girls about Christianity, as well as how to sew English style, knit, and undertake other household uh, skills. Here's a wonderful, wonderful letter that survives. It's in the Grey Roots Museum in Owen Sound with uh, other objects of Nani's and precious resources there on Nani and her family. Anyways, this personal note, which survives in Owen Sound at the Grey Roots Museum, written in Anani's own distinctive spelling, reads, Dear sister, when I was a child, you gave me clothes to wear, not because I was naked, but because you wanted me to be good and tell me that Jesus died for me. You taught little Indian girls in that little house across the road, and you taught them how to sew and many other things. As for my part, I thank you for what I now know, but more to that God that sent you at the credit to instruct the poor Indian girls in the way to heaven. Here's the key line. And this is written in her, it's, it's slightly awkward in parts, but uh, totally comprehensible. This last line is quite clear and it, it very touching, very, has a great impact. <laughs> she ends her letter. This was sent to Eliza some years later, thanking her for what she did when Nani was a young girl. And Nani in this note ends, how good you were to me, young girl who once lived at the credit. And what a naughty girl. I was not to know your kindness. That's basically, isn't that delightful? I just adore that letter. I'm so pleased to find it. One of the great discoveries of my research career. 1837. Oh, that's a big year in Upper Canada. As Ontario was then called, there was a rebellion against the autocratic administration. And William Lyon Mackenzie was involved. That's not our topic today. If that's the year... Just before that, those troubles broke out, Peter and Liza took Nani with them to London, England. The young 13-year-old girl spent approximately one year in England, traveling to London via New York City. With Actually, she went with Eliza in the early summer of 1837. Peter joined them later in the fall. 
As a gift, probably for Eliza's family, they brought with them a birch bark canoe make, made by the late Simcoe Anishinaabe Methodists. They reached London, a city of over 1.5 million people. It was the largest and richest city in the world. Incidentally, Calgary has a population about that today. But in those days, London, same population, one almost, well, roughly 150, um, um, oh my gosh, 1,500,000 people. London was the largest and richest city in the world. Now, of course, there's many, many that size. As her uncle said during his first visit to England a few years previously, he found that in London here, quote, the people are as thick as mosquitoes. Well, Nani must have thought the same. In London, Nani stayed at the large home of her aunt's wealthy family. She stayed in, in Lambeth, not far from the soap and candle factory, they'd, the business they'd had for two centuries. And we described that in episode uh, five with Peter and Eliza. And I also introduced Norwood, 10 kilometers to the south of the city, where the fields had an attractive country home. So Nani was exposed to this aspect of the very, very wealthy English society. She also learned during this year abroad that the importance of title deeds, of getting title to your land. And Peter spoke about this intense and consistently again and again. And this was one of the reasons he'd gone over to um, help get more support for the schools, but also to get land rights respected. The credit people did not have a land title to their lands on the Credit River. And this this was absolutely increasingly, excruciatingly difficult for them. They had no clear title to all the improvements uh, that they were making. And Peter repeatedly brought this forward. As a young girl of 13, Nani, very sharp young woman, absorbed information quickly. Her useful impressions of how her uncle fought authority served her well in her own struggle for Anishinaabe land rights. Back to Canada, Nani met an uh, Englishman, an English shoemaker from Lancashire. He was a devout Methodist. He'd been doing, uh, was in the area of the mission, uh, actually helping at some points. He was this school uh, shoemaker. And uh, he had a great interest in First Nations affairs. They, they began a relationship. She was a, he was almost two years, uh, twice as old. The age gap was 13 years. He was 27 and she was 14. But they got along well, and Eliza, uh, Peter, and um, Eliza's parents, they, they approved of this relationship, and, well, they married, and with the full support of, of the parents and uh, Peter and Eliza and everything, every, everyone was behind this. Despite the age difference, actually, the two proved extremely compatible, with similar interests and a common religious outlook. We are so lucky that William was on the scene because he's left some very, very graphic descriptions of his wife, which are just add flesh and bones to the skeleton of knowledge that we have. William uh, had, he had uh, not terrific education, but he had enough. He was a, a read, could read and write. As an older man, he served on the township council. Um, he was, he'd been a, he also, he learned how to be a farmer. He farmed and a very talented, versatile person. Um, he, his, his writing is, is very, um, well, it's, it's, it's endearing because it's, it's not, it's slightly awkward, but it, it very graphic and, and real and direct talk. Here's what, how he described his wife. Nani, quote, was a general favorite amongst both Indians and white people. There was something in her natural appearance and behavior which at once introduced her to the notice and attention of all with whom she came in contact without any effort on her part. She was equally at home amongst all classes of people, whether in the mansions of the rich, the poor man's cottage, the backwood sh shanty, or the bark or rush wigwam of the Indian. She was kind to all, a special friend to the poor and suffering. She loved Jesus. Her attachment was noble and strong towards the Methodist Church, to whom she was indebted for her Christian education. Wonderful. William and uh, Nanny wanted to have a large family. Eventually, they'd have eight children. Uh, now, they're concerned, though. This is, this is very serious. The credit people are not obtaining title to the lands. Queen Victoria, well, verbally told her colonial minister to look after this or look into it, but nothing happened. In the end, nothing did happen. And 
well, it was very, it, it just was so unsettling that um, Nani and uh, William, there was an opportunity to go north up to uh, Owen Sound area. The, there, the Anishinaabeg still, there no, no no treaty in that immediate area. And the Anishinaabe, they were inviting other Anishinaabe to come and settle amongst them. So they did, uh, uh, three other families as well. They relocated to the remaining lands on the Saugeen Peninsula, now the Bruce Peninsula, and uh, that's where they went. And they, they were welcomed and they started to farm and all's well, except that in the 1850s, they signed up for mission work around Sault Ste. Marie. They went up to help the Anishinaabe in that area. Uh, William, of course, was very useful because he was a skilled farmer at this point and could teach agricultural techniques. And Nani went for religious education. So they relocated, uh, well, just uh, they left the farm and went north for about five years. Now, this was incredibly difficult because when they came back in 1857, they found their land, their farm, had been sold by the Indian Department. There had been another treaty in their absence. The government claimed that the land had been surrendered, and the petitions uh, Nani and her husband sent were without consequence. Nothing happened. Nani described the government's land policies as, quote, wholesale robbery and treachery. She wanted justice. She drafted a letter to the government. She argued, the department has made this excuse for robbing me and my children of our birth rate, which I inherited from my forefathers before the white man ever sat, set foot on our shore, shores. She tried to purchase the land back, William, of course, helping her. Um, no dice. Didn't work. And then the department brings in another element. The department determined that Nani and her children were not legally considered Indians since she had married a white man. Oh, gosh. Several fruitless trips to government house in Toronto followed. Her petition to the Canadian Parliament produced no results, but a number of Anishinaabe sided with her. Sided with her. The Ojibwe communities around the Georgian Bay and Lake Simcoe promised their support, and at a council at Rama in 1859, the Ojibwe of Lake Simcoe and Huron asked her to take their land grievances to Queen Victoria herself. Well, William gave total support to his wife. She decided she was going to go. What an incredibly courageous woman. Off she go. And uh, another element, <laughs> I haven't told you this yet. She left. She was pregnant. She was several months pregnant. And still, she prepared to visit England with her grievances. As I mentioned, William gave his total support. He knew his wife's strengths. A woman, he wrote, quote, who could travel under almost all circumstances, whether by the noble steamer, the swift canoe, or the slow coasting of a small rowboat, rowboat, or billowacking for the night on the wild, uncultivated shores of our northern lakes. Nanny went, why, she later wrote, why, my trust was in God and the justice of my, of my people. She was convinced she was right. And she found support amongst non-Indigenous people, in first in Rochester, New York, then in New York City. The Quakers came forward. Oh, incidentally, in Toronto, the Globe called her an imposter and claimed that Indians could purchase land in Upper Canada where they were very well treated. <laughs> oh, my gosh, the Globe totally opposed to her, calling her an imposter. Another, another burr in their saddle. Unbelievable. But a committee of Quakers disagreed. After examining her credentials and investigating her story, they agreed to help. They raised money to pay for her passage to England. Oh, there's a wonderful. The Quakers are so, well, they're so literate and so concerned, social justice and whatnot. And there's a wonderful quote from a Quaker source. Someone, well, in the, one of the big meetings in New York where about $500 collected for, for Nani's trip across the North Atlantic. Um, Nani, uh, oh, she, in a melodious her voice, poured out her fevered, uh, her fervent petition for the divine blessing for herself on her lonely pilgrimage and called for help uh, against those white men who were persecutors. And at last, and this is the quote right from this Quaker source, and for those, their pers her persecutors, broken with sobs, I'll repeat, and 
this is what she said at the very end about the white men who were her persecutors, those that were giving her such a difficult time. Quote, here's how she ended. As for these last individuals, and her voice broke, broke with sobs, she made a prayer. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The Quaker audience was moved to tears. Ani, Nani now, armed, thanks for the for financial support, left for England. The Quakers in England supported her, and Aborigines Protection Society came behind her. And she was able to meet the colonial secretary, the Duke of Newcastle, and shortly thereafter had an audience with Queen Victoria herself. And this is delicious. This is delightful. Another great research discovery of my half century in indigenous history. Here it comes. On June 19th, 1860, the Queen met her and noted in her journal that her Indian visitor spoke, quote, English, and she spoke it quite well. Queen Victoria added that the Indian visitor had come to present a land petition on her people's behalf. Now, what is curious is, the Queen made no mention of Nani's pregnancy, which in her ninth month must have been quite obvious. Well, just after, three weeks after meeting Queen Victoria, Nani gave birth in London to a boy. And, well, she named him Alsop. That was the family name of, of her host. Wonderful. Why? At Buckingham Palace, Nani had gone wearing European dress. Now, why? Now, here's the woman. Here's the here's her personality. Here's the festiness. Here's the punch to her. When asked by the press why she dressed as a European on this important mission to meet Queen Victoria, she answered, this is the way we dress. We are not pagans. We try to be like white people and do what we can to be like the civilized people. End of quote. Although she traveled throughout Britain dressed like a Canadian settler, wherever she went, Nani presented herself as First Nations. And here's a direct quote. I am an Indian. The blood of my forefathers runs in my veins, and I am not ashamed to own it. For my people were a noble race before the pale faces came to possess their lands and home. Wonderful, strong, granite, granite light strength. Thanks to pref- references and to the only known surviving photograph of her, apparently taken about this time, a physical description of Nani can be made. She was uh, 36 years old at this point, tall, had a had dark complexion, black hair, and sharply defined facial features. And her voice, quote, according to the, this journalist, English press, her voice was, quote, quote, clear, natural, and rather, and rather melodious. End of quote. Although English was not her mother tongue, she spoke it well. Well, what was the end of all this? And Annie returned to Canada. In the end, she did not return her Indian status back. And this is ironic because Eliza, Peter's wife, born and raised in England, had Indian status because she married Peter Jones. Nani, because she married William Sutton, (laughs) a female marrying a non-Indigenous man, lost hers and she didn't get it back. She nor did she re- receive the right to re- to purchase her fa- farm, but the Indian Department finally did make one concession. It allowed her non-Indigenous husband to buy the land originally given to them in 1845, on which they still lived and wanted to remain. Her family then was eventually permitted to purchase the land, but only in the name of William Sutton. Nani kept up her struggle for First Nations rights through the 18, early 1860s. She and her husband advised the First Nations of Manitoulin Island about their land title, which had been promised to them forever, gener- generation before, but of course, that, that it was not being observed. So Nani and her husband advised them on, on what their rights were, able, helping them to fight back. The Suttons also helped the Anishinaabeg of the Saguin Peninsula Bruce Peninsula, with their claim to fishing rights in Lake Huron. She criticized this wholesale robbery, the government's attempt in 1861 to purchase Manitoulin Island, all of it, for non-Indigenous settlers. Following her return to North America, then Nani kept at it. She kept on as an advocate for First Nations land and fishing rights. Her family was 
again, treated poorly though, but at least they were, through William, they were able to buy back the land and they they they, they were able to keep going and the children were raised bilingually and biculturally. And, but the sad part was Nani's health was not good. Following the birth of her final child in 1864, her health steadily declined and she died from an asthma attack in September 1865. William survived her by nearly 30 years and died on the farm they had both fought for so hard to keep. He never remarried. Well, enter young researcher. That's what I was 40 years ago. And I discovered, well, through anthropologist Rosamund Vanderberg of the University of Toronto, this would be, boy, a long time back, Rosamund had done field work at Cape Croker which is where the community of what Nani was connected with had relocated. Cape Croker is north of Owen Sound. And uh, in this work at Cape Croker, Nani, uh, well, Rosamond made inquiries about Nani. She undertook field work in the community in the mid-1970s, and she shared with me what she found out about Nani. And this is a century after her death, more than a century after her death. Rosamond Vanderberg wrote me, She'd found the older people she'd interviewed, quote, were very proud of none. Sorry, the problem with this research game is you get emotionally involved. I think she's been tested. From my next episode... I'll, re- I'll recover my composure and uh, we'll return to the subject. This time it should be a, a very interesting character. Oh, he's a delight. Um, he's on the other side of the fence. He's a official with the Indian Department. So let's cross the street and look at Lord Barry, Superintendent General of Indian Affairs in the Canadas in 1855. And uh, there, again, what's the attraction for me here is uh, the... Just like I just I just like him so much because we've got records, we've got incredible records, and we can describe this man in great detail. He was in charge of Indian affairs in the Canadas, fifteen thousand people in 1855. And uh, what was his previous experience? He'd well, he had none. He'd never been to North America before. But we'll reserve that story for our next episode. Thank you.